Welcome everybody to this talk organized by the Center for Social and Economic Behavior by Professor Susan Fisk from Princeton University, 21st Century Diversity. We are not stuck with stereotypes. I admit it fills me with considerable pride that Susan has taken the time to be here today because she is one of the most prolific and prominent and accordingly most likely one of the busiest, busiest social psychologists of our time. And there is a saying in psychology that people study topics that concern themselves. Susan's most frequently cited empirical paper is a model of warmth and competence. And the exchange we had over the years showed that this notion in psychology is absolutely true, as she is both warm and extremely competent. So please welcome. <laughs> Susan Fisk from Princeton. Well, thank you for that very generous introduction. Uh, in fact, I'm going to be talking about that model today and making the argument that the model seems to apply quite widely, although uh, my, my colleagues from Cologne have also taught me that there are limits to it, which is good because nothing is truly universal. Um, but while I'll be talking about our, um, the extent to which stereotypes are part of the natural way that we make sense of other people and can we get beyond them and if so, how? So homophily is the elegant term that people use in the social sciences for preferring people who are like you. But in our globalizing world, we're meeting more and more diversity. And so what's the, that creates a tension for people. Uh, people prefer other people who are familiar to them and similar to them and stable and kind of all the same. But you, that's not likely in modern life. Immigration and globalization are creating more and more contact with diversity all the time. And everybody has to deal with that. Uh, so these things are really contradictory to each other. So how do people cope with this? Well, one of the things that people do uh, is they take shortcuts. And you can view a stereotype as a shortcut. They they put these unfamiliar people into clumps and then generalize. And it's um, a quick way to cope. So the question is, if this is such a natural, spontaneous process, are we stuck with these stereotypes? And I would like to say, maybe not. So the, the model that we've been using for the last 20 years um, is the stereotype content model um, developed with Amy Cuddy and Peter Glick. Uh, and the, the model suggests that people stereotype other people to navigate social diversity. You can't interview every single person you walk past on the street. You have to make, take shortcuts and categories are shortcuts that people take and then they generalize. So the first question you need to ask about the person walking down the street toward you or a group moving to your nation or to your neighborhood is, are they friend or foe? Are they on your side or not? What's their intention? And people do this because they think that intention predicts um, behavior. Uh, guards do this, military guards call out, friend or foe who goes there, are you on our side or not? Once you know the intention, you also need to know whether they can act on their intention because if they can't act on their intention, they don't matter to you as much. So this is the framework that we've developed and it's surprisingly simple and surprisingly useful. Uh, so what you get is a warmth by competence space that um, predicts various things and also is intuitive. The evidence we have by now comes from surveys and experiments and these seemingly, I put it in quotes, universal dimensions, suggest that stereotypes are sticky, that everybody's using them and so they're, they're gonna be likely to be cognitively sticky. Um, but in the end, I'm gonna show you some maps for hopeful futures that suggest that stereotypes are not stuck, that human beings actually get used to diversity with enough exposure. And all this matters, the economists are sitting there wondering, why does this matter, what the thoughts that are in people's heads, they matter because people act on their stereotypes and it predicts behavior. So this is a depiction of the stereotype content model, the warmth by competent space. In the high, high part of the space, these are pictures of people that Princeton students said 
were part of their in-group, uh, Americans, other students, people they admire and respect. Um, and so these are groups that are seen as high on both dimensions. In direct contrast to that are groups that are seen as low on both warmth and confidence. And all over the world, homeless people or refugees or um, Roma people, people who don't have a, a fixed address, are seen as low on warmth and confidence. Drug addicts also are seen that way. And the emotion that they elicit from people is disgust and contempt. It's a pretty bad place to be. But what our model predicts are also mixed quadrants. So that, that's the novel part of our model. It's not just I love them or I hate them, but there's some ambivalence. So for example, people who are seen as well-intentioned but incompetent include older people and people with disabilities. And they elicit pity, which is a mixed emotion. Not only are the cognitions mixed, but the emotions are mixed. I feel sorry for you. I'd like to help you, but only as long as you stay below me and grateful. The other mixed quadrant is the high competence, low warmth one. Uh, these rich people are not, fa in fact, Princeton students. Um, they're picked to be recognizably rich or um, corporate types. And they elicit envy, which is also a mixed emotion. It says, I admit that you have something that um, I admire and that I wish I had, and really I'd like to take it away from you if I could. So these quadrants replicate in general um, all over the world. Here's an example of the kind of data that we have. So these are ratings of groups on warmth and confidence and what the consensus is. Um, you can see that middle class people are high, high. In the United States, white people and Christians, men and women, blue collar people are all in the high, high part of the space. In the low, low part of the space are poor people in the US uh, and teenagers. <laughs> teenagers are seen apparently as kind of worthless. Um, and as a parent, I sort of understand why children are seen as um, very well-intentioned, but not very competent along with old people. Uh, and in this particular data set, gays. And then if you look in the lower right, you see rich people who are always in that quadrant all over the world. And in the U.S., because of its particular history, Asians are, and, and Jewish people are also on that edge. So this is just an example of the kind of data we have. The circles are um, cluster analysis results. So here's another example uh, coming from Germany, uh, Frank Osbrook's data. So you see in Germany, in the high, high part of the space, you have single people, which is interesting to me. Somebody's gonna have to explain that, whoops. Yeah. Um, so you have Germans, um, men, but not women, um, so men are more competent, and if you look at the women, they're more warm. Uh, it's interesting to look at. Rich people are in the lower right, as they always are, but so are feminists and career women. Um, so, uh, and if you look in the lower left, homeless people are there, but also welfare recipients and unemployed people. And um, he doesn't really have a pity quadrant so much, but senior citizens, and maybe housewives end up in that direction and people with physical and mental disabilities. Anyhow, so these are some German data I thought you'd be interested in. We can talk about the groups that are in the middle part of the space. There's some answers about that too um, at the end if you're interested. So by the, oh, so what, I, what I'm taking as evidence for the usefulness of this model is that when you look at the data points, they spread out in the warm by competent space in ways that make sense to people. And that also correlate with other um, variables that we care about like emotions and behavior. So by now we have evidence for stereotypes like these being sticky because we find that all over the world when you ask people about groups in their society, people can rate them on warmth and confidence and they spread out across the space. Uh, it even works on other species. So um, who's, who's like us, our dogs and cats and horses, they're warm and competent. Who's not warm and competent? Fish, lizards, snakes, chickens. Um, are low. And then the predators are competent, but cold, 
And then the, in the penny quadrant, you have hamsters, rabbits, cows, and ducks. And I think it's ironic that we eat the animals that we pity. Well, except for hamsters. Um, anyway, so this is just to say the critical thing is intention. We also have some data, which I'm not gonna show you about AI, different kinds of AI and people's feelings about which ones have good intentions and which ones have bad intentions. Um, this format for stereotyping seems to apply over time. So these are some data from the United States in 1933. You can see that um, if you take the measures that they used at the time, there were 84 adjectives that people could check off uh, that boiled down to warmth and confidence. You see that Americans at the time these are Princeton students actually, were rating Americans in English as being both warm and competent and Turkish people as being neither. Uh, and then you can see Germans are in the competent but not so warm quadrant along with Japanese, Jews, Irish at the time, and Chinese. And then you can see the black people were seen in the pity quadrant according to these data. Whoops, I don't know why my mouse did that. Um, and then the same, uh, method was used in 2003 by uh, this crew of people in my lab. And um, you can see that very many of the groups are in the same parts of the space, but the space is still working is the main message, even if there are some changes. Um, so it seems seemingly over time. Now, one way to look at change over time and stereotype content is by looking at what happens with immigrants. So these are people's, Americans' ratings of different kinds of immigrants. You can see, for example, the Canadian immigrants to the US are seen as the ideal. They're better than Americans from our point of view. Uh, in the low, low part of the space, you see Mexicans, Latinos, South Americans, and Africans. So when people are talking about the immigrant problem, that's really who they're talking about. They're talking about people of color. But I wanna bring up something else here, which is that undocumented and first-generation immigrants are in the low, low part of the space. But if they, are, if they st stick around for, th for three generations and get documents, then they move up to being in the all-American part of the space. So there is a possibility of groups changing their positions over time. These are generic immigrants. I have to qualify my um, optimism by saying, if you say uh, third generation African, they don't move as much. Or third generation anything, they don't move as much. So if you pit ethnicity against documentation and generation, ethnicity wins. But there's at least a possibility of some hope um, that more groups could join the in group. So this is um, some data that I, uh, from Germany on uh, stereotype content of subgroups of refugees. And the question I'm asking is, you know, over time, over three generations, will these folks move out of the low, low, low part of the space um, and which subgroups are seen more negatively than others? It's a question. So, I, I've argued that diversity is uncomfortable, but we know from social psychology from 50 years or, or more of research that interdependent group contact can change that under certain circumstances. When people interact with other people who are different from them and they need them for something, they're on the same team and the authorities think it's a good idea and it's an in-depth um, type of contact, not just festivals and food. Um, people's stereotypes can change, but that's a very expensive way for a society to change stereotypes. Um, so I wonder whether, the, we wondered whether the third generation effect is all this kind of complicated intergroup contact. And maybe there are other ways for people to get used to people who are different from them. And the question we asked um, was whether a more passive form of contact would work. In other words, do people just get used to people who are different from them? Do they habituate? If you see people on the subway day after day uh, who are from some other country, and at first you're a little nervous about them, but then nothing bad happens, do you then see them um, as more benign? 
So we have data uh, from the US showing that diversity can change to be toward the in-group. Let me give you the premise. So we have stereotype content models um, maps from all 50 states. And if you look at Maine and Wyoming on the left, they look quite spread out in the way we typically expect to see. But if you look at Hawaii and New York, they're more clumped together. You might almost say that they're part of a melting pot, that they can't be differentiated much from each other. They're also more toward the high, high part of the space. So what's going on here? The in-group for Maine and Wyoming would be this, but the, and these are some of our least diverse states in the country. The in-groups for Hawaii and New York include everybody. That's why I'm saying it's like the, it's the proverbial melting pot. These are some of the most diverse states in our country. So this kind of pattern suggests that if you have a lot of diversity, people have gotten used to it and they say, I can't differentiate among these groups. They're all, they're, you know, Mexican. There are lots of kinds of Mexicans. I can't do it. But in Maine and Wyoming and Vermont, where I am right now, if it's 97% white and they've never met anybody who is a person of color, they say, oh, I know exactly what they're like. So it's ironic that when they have the least contact, they have the strongest images. So what's going on in Maine? Well, it's not very populated, it's beautiful, but you, know, you don't meet any people who are different from you. Same in Wyoming. In Hawaii, on the other hand, the same beach would be totally crowded with all different kinds of people and it's harder to maintain the stereotypes. And the same thing in New York. You see them on the subway and you, you get used to them. So we wanted to tackle this. Uh, and um, when I say we here, I'm talking about Bai and Ramos and I. So here's Wyoming and New York. We're trying to solve the problem. What's, the diff what's different about them? And here are all the pictures of them. Okay, so in this project, um, Bai and uh, Miguel have collected data from about 50 countries and 50 US states and 28 universities and a bunch of individuals. And we looked at the relationship between diversity and stereotype clumping or dispersion. So the idea is that if the stereotypes are clumping together, then people are not differentiating much. If they're dispersing in space, then people are differentiating. So uh, we used the Herfindahl Index and applied it to ethnic diversity of immigrants, the top 20 uh, immigrant groups. So we could look at um, the amount of ethnic diversity in different states, nations, um, and then ratings of universities and ind individuals, I'll get to that. So um, we also have a, a measure of the uh, dispersion of the SCM map. So in that case, it's um, the average of the Euclidean differences. So you can either have a dispersion, which the stereotypes are differentiated, or a melting pot where they're all, um, people are all the same. So what you see, if you look at a national level, for example, uh, and here I'm contrasting, say, Lebanon and South Africa, you can see South Africa is very, very diverse and has very little dispersion. Um, if, you, if you look at uh, Lebanon, it's got a great deal of dispersion and it's not very diverse. And um, Germany, just for comparison, uh, is here in the map. So you can check your intuitions against this. Um, the EU countries are by and large in the middle and um, on the left in the diversity index. Uh, the same thing happens in the US if you do it state by state. And even if you take out Hawaii, which is something of an outlier, um, what you see is the more diverse the state, um, the less the dispersion. So this is a psychological phenomenon. It's not just a, a macro level phenomenon. If you get individual people uh, rating different groups and you measure their individual dispersion, and then you ask them to talk about the 
uh, diversity in their environment. This was done in our state level data. Uh, it works at the individual level as well. And then um, the sort of proof of concept that it might be causal is uh, uh, data that actually that um, my husband, Doug Massey had collected students from 28 selective colleges and universities. Some of them went to more diverse um, colleges than their high school. So, you know, the triangles represent somebody who, um, whose data came in at high school level on um, the dispersion, well, it, the index is dispersion change. So people who went to more diverse colleges than their high school, uh, they, they, uh, the dispersion reduced. People who went to equally diverse schools, nothing much changed. So this is, this is a um, possible demonstration that there's some causality involved here. So this makes me optimistic because it suggests that people can habituate to diversity over time. Um, and it, uh, in the international data, it correlates with well-being. Because when diversity first happens, people get uncomfortable. Bob Putnam is right about that. Um, but you know, if you give people time and nothing terrible happens, and you don't have a leader who is exploiting people's fears, um, then people can get used to each other. <clears throat> well, the question is, why does this matter? It matters because stuck stereotypes cause behavior. So our model is that st these stereotypes of warmth and competence cause discrimination. The mediator, uh, the proximal cause is, is the emotions that people express. I'm not gonna get into that today. And the upstream predictor of all this is social structure. So groups that are seen as high status are seen as competent, groups that are seen as competitive are seen as not warm. And if you wanna change everything downstream, you work on changing the social structure or perceptions of it. But those are conversations for another day. What I wanna do now is switch over to, um, to the downstream behavior. But um, what we're gonna do is talk about um, these, the warmth and competence dimensions as behavioral uh, dimensions. So what I've talked about um, so far is correlational data. And I haven't talked about experiments so much. We've done experiments where we manipulate warmth and competence or we manipulate the structure and produce the next step in the causal sequence. Um, we also have data, as I said, from different countries, and we have data from uh, neural signatures of the various um, emotions and other reactions. But after 20 years, what we didn't have was actual behavior very often. Um, oh, sp spontaneous natural language. Oh, so it could go into it. But so um, my economist friends would be more interested uh, if there were some concrete behavior going on. So what we did was we directly measured stereotypes of warmth and competence using behavior. And in this particular project, we did it in the US and also in India to just as a proof of concept that it generalizes. And this, the collaborators on this are Jamie Walsh, who's getting a PhD at Oxford, and Naomi Vida, who's getting a PhD at Princeton. So let's talk about the warmth dimension. The, mo the best uh, operationalization we could think of at the time uh, was using the trust game. So uh, in the first study on this, we got Americans online and um, they could win real, real tokens for real money. Uh, I wanna say that we tried to uh, adhere to rules that economists use when they do research, that is no deception, real money, real people. And you'll see what we had to do to do that. So people made, um, we had stereotypic con categories that um, were rated on warmth and competence. And the incentive for the people doing them was that if the ratings aligned with previous studies, they were rewarded with a token. So they were supposed to try to decide what Americans think about these different groups. Um, we started out the process then by getting these groups and these are groups from the different quadrants. So we found actual people 
who fit these descriptions, including a homeless person uh, who uh, played the, the trust game. Each of these people are real individuals who um, said, if my partner gave me all the tokens, how many would I share back? If my partner gave me half the tokens, how many would I share back? So that these people gave their answers to hypothetical partners. So we had answers from real people from these four quadrants. Then the, then the participants in the actual study did two things. First, they rated people. Uh, they gave ratings to these people from the different quadrants and they played the game with the answers that these people had actually given in the past. So they're playing the game with actual people and not with um, hypothetical people. And they're playing for real money. So we worked really hard to make this very understandable to people to make sure they, they knew what they were doing. Um, this is online. Uh, and so we explained the trust game to them, which is more complicated than you might think. So, um, so you have five dollars that you can give to the other person. You can do as much, keep or give away as, share as much as you want. It gets multiplied, and the other person has a chance to share back with you. So it's a question of trust: how much you want to share with them. Um, and we paid them for one of the randomly selected games just to keep it manageable. So what we're predicting is that the warmth ratings of these different groups will totally predict the trust behavior. And that the competence ratings will not. Um, and what we find is exactly that. So and the, this is the first study we did on um, warmth operationalized as trust, the trust game. Um, And we did it again with Americans again online. And we improved on the first study. We did the two modules two weeks apart. So they did the ratings, um, either randomly assigned first or second. And they uh, did the game two weeks apart. So they couldn't just be using the one so easily to do the other. Uh, we gave them cash instead of tokens. We had them rate fewer other groups and other players. Um, and we did more um, ratings to make the scales more reliable. And with all those changes, again, it was quite clear what the difference was. Warmth um, predicted the, the trust much more than confidence did, which did not. We were able to run a sample in India, and we got the same results. Turning to competence, now, you know, one of the things is, if, if, if the trust game is about, I trust you to share back with me, you might have thought that competence would predict it because both warmth and competence are positive things, but they're different. So competence doesn't, if you understand the trust game, that's not gonna predict um, your behavior, um, the competence rating. So we thought, we tried to think of a game that we could play, have them, have them play, it would be only about competence and not about trust. And so we decided a form of kind of betting on whether the other person would be able to solve some problems. So um, we got, um, in, again, we got real individuals from these stereotype groups to try to solve several puzzles. The incentive they had for trying was to receive a token for each puzzle that they solved and that converted to um, well, depending on the country, but it converted to money in the US. The actual participant then guessed how many puzzles individuals from these groups would solve given only the group label. And they did it for all these different stereotypes and they received a token for each correct guess. Whoops, oh, this is happening. Um, so we asked a different group of people, here are some puzzles, people who can solve these puzzles, what are they like? And these are some of the words they came up with. So you can see that these are all about confidence, being able to solve the puzzles. In the first study, um, uh, they 
I'm looking at it's two weeks apart, but I think we did the first study separately. But anyway, they were two, the same two steps as before. They did ratings of the groups. And then in this case, they're guessing the individual's puzzle performance for cash. And we worked really hard to make, the, make it clear. In, in one study, there were 20 people. In the second study, there were 12 people. We asked them, we told them what we had asked these people to do, and they had to guess um, how much, how many puzzles they had solved. And they did this um, for, for real money. We showed them the puzzles. Some of them are easier for college educated people, and some of them are harder. But they were meant to draw on a variety of competencies. Uh, so the group's stereotypic competence predicts individual people's expectation of the number of puzzles that they would solve, despite incentives for accuracy. And it's all about confidence and not about want. So the reason that I bring this up uh, is that I think the stereotype content model provides really useful knowledge and it can be used in a lot of different circumstances. It's inexpensive, it's portable, it's indirect. And um, you get these incentivized cultural maps about who trusts whom and why and who respects whom and why when you do it with the experimental games. Uh, I, we work to make these faithful and ethical descriptions uh, without deception and they fit common sense. So, in terms of the utility, usefulness and application of these uh, methods, I think it's a pathway to measuring distinctive behaviors, combinations of warmth and confidence behaviors. <clears throat> so basically, um, what we were doing in this first, uh, in these first studies, we're looking at operationalizations of warmth and confidence. And down the road, we're gonna be looking at the discriminatory behavior of different kinds. Um, but again, it needs to be closely predicted by um, emotional prejudices, which I can talk about in the Q&A if you want. And again, the social structure is the primary cause. So you may think that you know me. Uh, this is a photograph from the German Psychology Today done by Jürgen Frank. Here she is, Ms. Professional. Really, this is me, without the stereotypes. And this is the lab that makes it all possible. So thank you. <laughs>